Hello, I'm Jane Sell. I'm the Deputy Director of Chiltern Teaching School Hub, which is part of Chiltern Learning Trust. We're a multi-academy trust of 15 schools, uh, predominantly around the Bedfordshire area. Um, we've recently embarked on a Subject Knowledge Experts uh, network, which is made up of a number of teachers across each subject discipline, leading in the subject both at primary and secondary to kind of move practice forward, looking particularly at curriculum development. And over the course of the work that we've been doing internally with the Trust, I thought it would be a really good opportunity to share some of this more widely so that you can sort of see what we're doing. And equally, it might be a case of some things that you can tap into to help move your practice forward as well. So in terms of the session, I think it's worthwhile just kind of running through the contents of this. And it might be that you want to skip ahead in the video. Um, if I get clever, I might put in some chapters as well. But just to kind of give you a bit of an insight of the content that we're looking to cover. So I want to answer the question around what computing is. Um, some schools are still moving forward in understanding what the subject is. A summary of the research review, looking at substantive versus disciplinary. And in computing, we refer to this as declarative versus procedural. Looking at some deep dives, but a light version of this. So this isn't a, a comprehensive, detailed uh, view of this. This is just kind of light touches on that. How we can look at an inclusive curriculum. So looking at how we support SEND students, but as well as students that are made up from different groups. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail. Some learning theory around semantic waves, and then just signposting to some curriculum resources so that it could be a case that you're looking at kind of enhancing what you already have. Or if you're starting from fresh, there's some great resources that you can start looking at. So what is computing? Now, computing as a subject has been around since 2014. It's had previous iterations in the past, but in 2014, there was a shift from what was predominantly previously known as IT into computing. And at a sort of top level, it may not seem that there's a huge significance in change, but those subject leaders, practitioners in departments will all be aware that there's quite a vast difference in the skill sets that are being taught to students. And the idea is, that computing is a subject that all young people should learn in order for them to be well informed, uh, to have a well informed understanding of the increasingly digital world that surrounds them. And this is kind of in a response to the changing economy. We think about the digital uh, era in terms of the fact of all of the jobs that are sort of changing in the markets. We think about AI and everything else that kind of goes in and around us at the moment and what the future might hold. And the idea is that the sort of IT curriculum that previously existed didn't necessarily arm students with the right skill sets to engage in tomorrow's society. Um, there's a couple of things that kind of, the way that I explain to people around how you get your head around what's the difference between IT and computing. And there's a blog post that I've put a link to and a QR code so you can scan it, which kind of uh, echoes, echoes this point as well. So I often refer and say that computing and IT can be thought of in terms of a car, in the fact that IT is the ability to drive that car, to use that car, um, whereas computing is that ability to break that car down to be the mechanic, the, the, bit, the, the engineering side of things. So it's using that same piece of equipment and that's where externally IT and computing may draw parallels and may be quite often lumped together because they're both to do with computers. But actually one's about being a user of computers whilst that computer science or computing aspect is around that ability to be that engineer, uh, the mechanic that actually can get stuck into what's under the hood of that computer. And that's a very general description, but it helps to get some context into there being some difference, even though you're working with the same tool. You've got a link there as well to the Royal Society's article, so you can read a bit more about that as well. So please do check out both of those. So why computing? I've kind of alluded to that previously on the um, slide just before this around the purpose of the change in the curriculum. I'm going to pause for a second. I'll let you pause the video and you can read through this uh, this purpose of study. This is just from the National Curriculum. You've got a link in the QR code again so you can read through in a bit more detail. But if you want to pause and have a quick read. And having read that, you're probably reading that and it feels like kind of that intense statement that schools um, strive to sort of write around why they want to teach what they want to teach. So it's got lots of influences there about what it is that the curriculum should be doing, what the ambition of the curriculum is. And this is probably something that we can all relate to and all agree with that actually there's nothing fundamentally wrong with what's being said. We might take that, we might change that, we might rewrite it. But fundamentally, this is why computing exists. 
And it's worth also kind of having an awareness about what computing looks like across different key stages. Now, I've deliberately not included key stage five because you can specialize in differing strands of this. But if we look at the curriculum from key stage one through to key stage four, so it's worth at this point noting that in the earlier settings, there's no curriculum for computing. That could be debated as to whether there needs to be or not, but for, the, for this present moment in time, there isn't. So in key stage one, we have computing, which is comprised of three different strands. So you've got computer science, digital literacy and information technology. And you can see that that spans across key stage one, key stage two, and then key stage three. And when students get to key stage four, that's when they typically will pick a discipline. And in most instances, computer science is the qualification that they'll go on to study. There are some schools that will deliver alternative qualifications, IT based qualifications, iMedia and so forth. But predominantly speaking, the kind of hope of the curriculum is that participants of a robust curriculum will move into a computer science GCSE. So if we look at those three strands or the pillars of progression in a bit more detail, you've got computer science, IT and digital literacy. You can pause the video and read the summary boxes. But just as I spoke earlier, we can look at them and use that analogy of the car again. So with computer science, we're talking about how to engineer, but in particular software and hardware. When we talk about IT, we're talking about how to apply software and hardware. This might be how we use this. And digital literacy is around making the right selection for which software and hardware we want to use, but equally about its responsible use as well. So on the previous slide, there was a link to the research review and a QR code. Um, you may well have uh, paused and scanned that. And this research review was a really comprehensive dive into the computing curriculum past and present where we're at looking at lots of key pieces of information it's quite a lengthy document but do spend some time reading it what i've done is pulled out some bits that i think are relevant to consider and focus on and this for example is around the national context so as i mentioned already computing as a curriculum was introduced in 2014 it was a case that the ict curriculum was too heavy with office skills basic digital literacy which was quite often taught through other subjects that didn't necessarily need to have its own dedicated time and didn't necessarily equip, as we already said, uh, students with the skill sets to engage with the future of society within its technical developments. The idea is this powerful knowledge that people will be uh, enriched within through a computing curriculum. And it is a case that obviously there's still opportunity for this to develop and grow. It wasn't the case that in 2014, it was a case that everyone was gonna switch over from IT to computing. And you'll hear about some of the specialist data as we move forward. But there was research at the time around the fact that about 65% of the current uh, IT teaching uh, body wouldn't be in their current state um, subject knowledge experts or equipped to go and deliver a computing curriculum without some upskilling. So leaving 35% being comfortable and ready to deliver the new curriculum. So it is an, continuing to still be an area of progress. The subject really looked at the state of computing within primary schools. And as I mentioned already, there's no uh, curriculum for early year settings. Um, although, as I mentioned, it could be quite hotly debated when you think about the skill sets of young children. We've all heard stories around young children you know, sometimes as young as two years old, they've unlocked their parents' phone, opened up an application and run up a huge bill. So all of that aside, the current state of play is that primary school key stage one is where the taught curriculum begins. And we know from the research that the basis of someone's success is built upon their foundations, their early exposure to a curriculum. So this is where the primary schools play a huge role in the success of students over a long period of time. And there are barriers that exist in primary schools. The research highlights the fact that physical resources and budget provide a significant barrier at primary schools to engage with computing as a curriculum. There's a perceived lack of skills and knowledge to teach a subject effectively, and that the language in the curriculum can be overly technical. And I think that's probably something that we could probably all agree that sometimes it can be quite alien and it only gets more alien as the curriculum goes along. The research also highlighted the fact that in many primary schools, teachers were concerned about their own personal subject knowledge and the resources available to teach the intended curriculum. The review said that in secondary schools, one hour a week of computing was not enough to teach the key stage three curriculum. And I think we can probably all um, fight as much as we want to try and get more curriculum time. And actually in reality, one hour a week is, is doing, we're doing well to get that. I think that there are schools out there that have less. There are some schools that have more, but typically one hour per week at Key Stage 3 is a fairly standard in a lot of schools that I've worked with. 
In terms then of what that sort of translates to a GCSE, so what, since the introduction of computing as a subject, the report found that 80% of schools were providing year 11s with a choice of computer science as a GCSE, which is good. Is it necessarily there? Perhaps not, but again, that could be lots and lots of uh, reasons and barriers for that. In terms of schools with higher proportions of disadvantaged students, GCSE computer science wasn't seen to be an option um, as much. And the 7.6% of pupils were in a school that didn't offer a key stage four computing qualification. Now that's not necessarily computer science, that might be an IT equivalent um, or something else uh, that may be an offer. So there's still lots of pupils who don't necessarily have fair access to the curriculum. Obviously, as can be expected with the introduction of computing at key stage three and four, um, within secondary schools that we would see that A-level numbers would, would significantly increase. So by 2016, so two years after the introduction of the computing curriculum, A-level numbers were doubling within our schools. One of the things that I thought was really interesting when this was a report was this idea of subject specialism. So in particular, the qualifications that teachers held with regards to computing. And in secondary schools, it's that perception around the fact that those teaching their subjects have qualifications in their chosen discipline. And this is applicable across all curriculum, not just computing. So you can see clearly here, 46% of computing teachers held a computing qualification. And that means that in theory, that 50%, over 50% of our students being taught computing in secondary schools in England are being taught by non-specialists. Therefore, there's a huge amount of work to be done to upskill and develop all staff, not just those that hold qualifications, but those that don't as well, to ensure that there is equity within the classrooms and that students get a fair deal from the teaching that we deliver. Again, drawing upon some of the information that was in the subject review is this uh, principles of substantive and disciplinary knowledge. And in computing, this is referred to as declarative and procedural, and they're to somewhat interchangeable. Pause the video, have a quick read of this section. It will give you a bit of a flavour as to how we might define those. So to help you gain an understanding of what we mean by substantive and disciplinary, I've got on here for you a really concrete example. And this is something you might do with your students. You wouldn't necessarily explain to them about substantive and disciplinary, but again, that idea of an example that we can grasp. So we know that our substantive, our facts, our rules, cakes consist of eggs, flour, sugar, butter. Um, you might have other stuff in there as well, but just as a basic recipe, they consist of those ingredients. The disciplinary or the procedural knowledge is the fact that you can take that substantive knowledge and make a cake in this instance. So that's our concrete example. If we move this into something more subject specific, we can start to look at binary as a primary example. So we've got computers use binary. It's a fact. Binary is ones and zeros. Those principal rules that we understand enable us to then access our disciplinary knowledge or our procedural knowledge around the ability to convert binary into decimal numbers, text into ASCII. Okay, so it's kind of that idea around the, the rules and the facts that exist within computing. There's plenty of those and what those rules and facts amount to in terms of the output, what is the, how we actually engage with that data, what we do with that in its kind of most simplest form. You can see as well that I've got a blog post there. It's not computing specific. It's just around the different uh, different types of knowledge. It's a really good read that I would uh, strongly suggest having a little bit of a reading for. It goes into a lot more detail than what I've got here. One of the things that's really worth acknowledging and part of the work that we've been doing at the Trust is looking at substantive and disciplinary knowledge. And one of the things that we were sort of early on uh, identifying the fact that there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship so it's not a case that one piece of substantive knowledge equates to a singular piece of disciplinary knowledge. It actually quite often is a fact that actually multiple pieces of substantive knowledge, multiple rules, facts, fit, um, create a singular piece of disciplinary knowledge. And they aren't, in, they aren't exclusive of each other as well. It might be that there's overlap and inter interdependencies as well. So deep dives. Now, as I said, there's there's plenty of stuff out there if you want to look at specific computing deep dives and so forth. But this is kind of just a summary of some of the things pulled together. So if you're preparing for a deep dive, there's a few things that I think are really fundamental. So the first one is make sure you know your department. That's inside and out. You know everything. You could sit there and be confident that if you said this is happening right now in that classroom, I know that the, mark, the books will be marked if you're using books. I know the online work will have been fed back. I know what the students are going to say. You can predict what's going to happen. And that kind of comes back to that knowing your staff as well. So knowing your staff as people it makes 
just for sense as, as, as a line manager, but equally knowing where their skills and strengths are, what they need to develop on. Um, think about the questions you might get asked as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. And be honest, there's absolutely no point in sitting there trying to sell the dream department if the inspector is going to come round and see things that don't match up. If you've said, for example, we know that assessment is an area for development for us, this is what we're doing, this is our plan, this is where we've come from and this is where we're moving to, that's going to be far better received than if you um, give some information that may not be accurate. I've got two links for you, one which is Mark White, the HMI lead for East of England, um, talking a little bit around the subject of computing, how we might see sequencing in the curriculum, lots of really useful information. It's a 20 minute video, do set some time aside for that. What you've also got is some sample questions for deep dives. Now these are um, non-subject specific, it's just simply a case of pulling together a series of questions in a not particularly pretty document, it's just in a sort of Word document that you might use or we'll start to think about and consider how you might answer those questions. So do have a look at that as well. But to give you a bit of insight, here are some questions, just a very, very top level, very light view as to what you might get asked. And I'll talk you through a little bit about what you might present in the answer to these questions. So you might get asked about the context of your department. It might not be worded quite explicitly as tell me about the context of your department, but this is that scene setting. This might be where you talk about the makeup of your department, the fact that you've got specialist or non-specialist, the fact that you've got for example, how many classes, the GCSE cohorts, the gender balance, the kind of objectives of your curriculum um, might start coming through here as well. Just generally the overview of the environment that you're working with. And this is something that's going to be unique to your school. It'll be a case that it's specific and it's about, as I said, knowing your department and your chance to demonstrate that. In terms of the quest of your curriculum, like I say, it may not get asked in that, that sort of sense. You might be asked about what you're trying to achieve, your intent of your curriculum, the curriculum, curriculum sequencing, the strengths and weakness. This is around that element of what you're trying to create, what it is that a student who has come through your education, through your school, what will they have by the end of the time with you? So you might have something along the lines of them being unconsciously competent users of IT, that can engage with society's ever increasing demand on technology. You know, that's a really short sentence to explain what it is that you're trying to achieve. But that kind of idea around what it is your mission statement, your vision, and that might be influenced by your school's culture and ethos. It might well be about the curriculum pathways that you have. It might be about the state of your current department. It's something that is relevant to yourself, but it sets the scene and sets the tone of what it is that you're trying to achieve with those students and where you kind of pin your curriculum. You might get asked around what progress pupils uh, make, and this might actually be around assessment, what assessment looks like, how does assessment um, take place, what's the uh, output of assessment, what you do of, on the back of assessment, how do you know they make progress? And this is again a series of questions for you to consider around how you might answer those, have you got those systems in place? So if you can't answer these questions, think about what you need to go and change retrospectively. A question that quite often gets overlooked by departments is what does the provision for send look like? And this isn't about the fact that you have resources on a different coloured sheet, you haven't changed anything significantly, it's around what does your department do? And we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides time. And equally how do you ensure staff get the right support to develop the curriculum effectively? As we've said already that over 50% of the staff in schools don't necessarily hold a subject specific qualification. Therefore, we need to consider how it is that we're developing our staff. What CPD do we put on? What do we do to enhance our staff to ensure that there's equity in the classroom? And this is, I refer to the teacher lottery, in the fact that you might be in a department where there are two teachers, for example, you as the subject expert, the subject lead, who has curriculum control and oversight, who knows things inside and out. And then your partner teacher in your department or if you're in a primary school, the other teachers in the school, thinking about can they deliver the lessons to the same standard as you? Does a child in your school lose out because they've got a different teacher or the same teacher? Is there gonna be equity and parity between those two classes? Is an inspector gonna go from one class to the next class and see the same quality of teaching, see the same outcomes, see the same student that enters at the same point leave at the same level of progress? And that's a real challenge there's a real challenge that all schools face to upskill staff to, to get them to that level. 
So some of the questions you might want to ask yourself. How do you provide equity in the departments? How do you ensure that non-specialists and expert practitioners are delivering that same standard? What CPD do we provide? Okay, so what development are you providing as the subject expert in your school to those non-specialists? When you're having department meetings, are they spent carrying out administration and filling out reports, or are they sharing pedagogy and practice? Is it a case that actually it's results time and you need to put all the data into your SIM system or whatever else it is that you might be using? Or is it you're going to spend that one hour really talking about what you're delivering that week, how you can get that message across to students most effectively, what sort of uh, subject knowledge enhancement needs to take place as well. So thinking about using those times effectively. So an inclusive curriculum is one that enables all students to have opportunity to flourish and grow. Now, rather than me sit here and try and give you an exact answer in the space of a minute or two as to how you're going to support send students in your classroom, because there are lots of different strategies. I want to just signpost to three sort of main links. You've got a future learn course, which is a couple of hours of um, self-directed study that will help you to understand how send works within computing. And equally, again, you've got the Teach Computing course, the National Centre for Computing Excellence. Um, it's again, a slightly lengthier course, but again, self-managed, self-paced, looking at how you might support uh, learners with SEND in computing. And again, really good strategies to look at. The SEND computing website at the bottom is just more about teaching ideas, but again, a really powerful tool to have in your arsenal to be able to help and support those learners. Because it's not just about necessarily being a knee-jerk reaction, but actually it should be best practice as well. So thinking about if you were asked that question as we looked at it in the deep dives, what do you do? What's the provision look like for SEND? If it's a case of all staff have attended this training, all staff employ the principles of we regularly engage with, and you've got evidence of that, that's going to support the fact that you're doing the right things by the students in your class. Diversity in the curriculum is something that in computing there's real opportunity for. If we look at lots of the top 10 richest people in the world and the sort of tech entrepreneurs that exist you know you've got Bill Gates at Microsoft you've got Steve Jobs at Apple you've got Elon Musk at Tesla you've got Larry Page and Sergey Brin at Google they all share this same idea or same same look uh, that sort of older middle-aged white male that doesn't really create inspiration for the students that make up our classes if we think about the gender imbalance that sits at GCSE, you know, we know that it's a male dominated subject and there's a lot of work to be done around how we might be able to incorporate um, activities and work that actually appeals to all demographics. So there's a few links on the um, slide. And again, I haven't put QR codes for these, but there's a PDF uh, link at the end so you'll be able to get these. How we might be able to incorporate different um, classroom practice, different culturally relevant content that actually appeals to all demographics so that actually there isn't that barrier when it comes to moving forward within the subject. So have a look at those links. There's lots and lots of things within there that you might want to consider uh, applying in your practice. So the research review talks around the learning theory of students and how we might deliver the computing curriculum through a method called semantic waves. And this is quite likely to be something that you're already doing without perhaps having it in such a codified manner. So semantic waves um, is a piece of work that's been carried out. Uh, Paul Curzon has been doing some research recently on it and it, it sort of predates him as well. But in essence, uh, semantic waves are this idea of taking this abstract high level concept um, that we heard mentioned within the research review something that may be completely alien to the students in our class and taking them through a journey to understanding in a concrete example that they understand and building it back up to that abstract idea. So in this example, you can see we've got algorithms. So algorithms as a word um, our students may not have any understanding of, they may not have had any pre-exposure to it, but algorithms are a precise set of sequences or steps. You might define it as algorithms a sequence of steps to solve a problem. But again, that has no meaning to students. So we start to unpick that and unpack that meaning as we go down that curve of that semantic wave, looking at how we make similarities between the fact that algorithms are like instructions, are like recipes. 
okay and that starts to get hopefully to something that our students can kind of relate to and understand we get to a point where there's an activity using instructions or recipes quite often we talk about how people brush their teeth and how they have to put the toothpaste on the toothbrush first and the sequence of events that takes place but something that they can relate to we can start to then pin back on some of the more complex and technical understandings to build them back up to the point where they understand that abstract concept that we started with at the start of the lesson now the key thing with this is it's not necessarily a singular lesson it might be over a, a period of lessons or it might even be that it's over a short period of time than, than a singular lesson but that idea of introducing that high level concept unpacking it with more concrete and simple examples to then building them back up to that more complex understanding again and as i say this is something that we probably already do and isn't necessarily just a computing topic um, style of teaching but actually something you might see in other subjects as well there is some additional reading there. You'll find plenty of stuff if you search for semantic waves in a lot more detail. I've, I've given a really small snapshot of that, but just for you to think about when you're delivering lessons, planning lessons, how you might be able to take your students on that journey of semantic waves and make it fit your context. But you've got lots of information there um, within those two links that will be able to kind of give you a bit more information and a bit of a uh, more in-depth introduction. So curriculum resources. Now, curriculum resources, this is one of the things that people are immediately drawn towards. But what I would say is, obviously, these are there to support and help you. So a few of these links on here to help you. So the, the top one is the Teach Computing. You'll find a fully resourced curriculum, Key Stage 1 through to Key Stage 4, um, with resources, assessments, the works. But don't just download it and deliver it. It doesn't really work exactly that. You need to understand it. And it might be a case that you don't necessarily take the entirety of the curriculum. So it's worth sort of noting that in my experiences, uh, in my sort of preferred method, methods of delivery, I'll look at some of these resources and I might cherry pick some of them. It might be that something that I've developed I feel more comfortable with and therefore I'll use that. It might be that my curriculum is made up of 50, 60, 70 percent of this content. And that's absolutely fine. It's got to be right for your context. So the first uh, couple, in fact, the first three are there with resources, schemes of work and so forth. Eyes at Computer Science is uh, those of you that are A-level teachers, that's probably a really good resource to look at in terms of how you might be able to support your learners. The Hello World um, Big Book of Computing con Content, again, it's a free book. Um, it's not necessarily lesson resources, but it will give you a bit of an idea around the kind of aims of a curriculum. So you can start to see, am I piecing things to go together correctly? Am I looking at my sequencing in, a, in an appropriate manner? And then exam board websites, really, really um, underutilized. All exam boards will quite often have examples of their content and material and if you're looking at key stage four in particular that's going to kind of give you a bit of a sense as to what it is that you need to teach and to what level to help you with the pitching of work but again those links can be found quite easily um, on the pdf document so if you scan this qr code on a mobile device it will take you through to a link which will have this slide deck as a pdf so you can kind of click on any of the links and get anything that you want equally there's my twitter handle please do reach out to me by all means get in touch if you want to talk about anything computing more than happy to help where I can. Thank you.